Well, good morning. I want to welcome you to worship here at First ARP Church. What a joy it is for us to gather together on this Lord's Day, this one day out of seven set apart for worship and for rest. If you're a visitor here this morning, I want to extend a special welcome to you. We're so glad uh, that you joined us for worship. We hope that you'll join us again in the future. And if you're visiting with us and you never filled out one of our visitor sheets that you'll find in the bulletin, we'd love for you to do that. Placing the offering plate is uh, that time in the service. It just allows us to reach out to you and welcome you and uh, answer any questions that you might have about the church. A couple announcements before we begin our service. First is that our 2024 directories have been printed. You'll find them on the table here and also out uh, in the connector. I would ask that you take one per family to make sure that everybody gets one. Uh, but please uh, take a directory. Uh, just It's a good way to be able to stay in touch with each other uh, and encourage each other as the Lord brings people to mind. Uh, we are uh, transitioning our emails from uh, MailChimp to our uh, uh, church software called Subsplash. And so you will get a, a test email uh, this week. Uh, and then starting Friday and the beginning of next week, emails will just go out through a new server. Nothing's really changing just how we send them out. So pay attention. If for some reason you're getting emails and then you stop getting them, please reach out to the church office. Uh, that would be a big help. We don't want anybody to, to lose out on information uh, in a change of just how we communicate. For our ladies, remember that there's a Valentine's event February the 14th or February 17th, sorry, uh, the Saturday the 17th. There's more information uh, in your bulletin, uh, but ladies, plan for that. I hope that you'll come and enjoy that time. Also, uh, for our women, there's the, the retreat, uh, March the 8th and 9th. Uh, ladies, you do need to sign up for that. Uh, there's information in the bulletin. You can call the church office uh, or reach out to Jen Crin, our president of women's ministry, or Connie Kaiser, our uh, director of Christian education. As always, see the bulletin, the weekly email, and newsletter for all the announcements of things going on in the life of the church. Uh, several folks to be praying for. Mary Robinson, uh, Mary is going to have to have another surgery on her knee on Tuesday uh, to fix a tear in the tissue in her knee. So just be in prayer for her. I know this is a, a setback and, and disappointing and frustrating, uh, and especially with Bob continuing to recover from his back surgery. So just be in prayer for the Robinsons uh, that the Lord would provide for them. Elijah Hardison is one of our former preschool students and also the granddaughter of Mike Duncan, who's our custodian. Uh, she's been battling leukemia over the last several years, but has been transferred up to Duke to try to receive some treatments. And they're just uh, struggling with how best to care for her and not really sure what is next. Uh, they were hopeful to do a liver transplant, but they're not sure that she's a candidate for that. So just tough. Uh, so be in prayer for them uh, that the Lord would encourage them uh, and provide for them. Lastly, we want to extend Christian love and sympathy to Libby Elder at the passing of her brother, Tim Sullivan. Uh, be in prayer for Libby and Buzzy and family as they grieve his passing. Well, brothers and sisters, we're here to worship the Lord. I want to remind you that in worship, we are not passive observers, but we are active participants. We are to participate in worship, singing praise to the Lord and hearing from his word read and preached. So let's take a few moments to quiet our hearts and to prepare for worship. Thank you. 
Our call to worship this morning is Psalm 103, the first four verses. God himself speaks to call us to worship him. Hear our call to worship. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Brothers and sisters, this is our great God. This is whom we are here to worship. And so I invite you, if you're able to stand with me and turn in your black notebooks to number 23, we'll sing Holy, 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 number 23. If you'll turn over to number 44, no sweeter subject, number 44. This might be a little less familiar of a song, uh, but it is a beautiful one and a reminder of what we believe.
Let us pray. Lord, there really indeed is no sweeter subject than you, our exalted King, and your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we're gathered here in this your house on this your day to praise your name, to worship you as the sovereign ruler of the world, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the author and giver of life, the God of all hope, the God of all comfort, the God of all peace, the risen Christ. Lord, we do worship you, and we're reminded that you indeed are holy, holy, holy. And Father, as we are here in your place, we ask that you would pour out your Spirit upon us. Lord, would you be honored and glorified with our worship. Lord, help us to set aside the things that distract us, even the good things in our lives. And Lord, would we focus on you. Lord, would you speak to us by your Spirit, through your Word. Lord, teach us more of who you are, so that we may know you and love you. And Lord, thank you for the gift of prayer, that you are a God who hears and answers our prayers. And so we ask that you hear us now as we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. You'll find in your bulletin a confession of sin. You know, it's uh, important as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ that we remember that we are sinners. We are sinners saved by grace, but each and every day we sin against a holy God. And so it is important for us to confess our sin. And so we're going to use the prayer printed in your bulletin as a unison prayer to confess our sins. We'll have a season of silent confession after that um, to close that time, and then we'll hear our assurance of pardon. So let's go to the Lord in prayer again, praying this prayer uh, from Ambrose, one of the church fathers. O oh Lord, you have mercy upon all. Take away from me my sins, and mercifully kindle in me the fire of your Holy Spirit. Take away from me the heart of stone, and give me a heart of flesh, a heart to love and adore you, a heart to delight in you, to follow and to enjoy you. For Christ's sake, amen. Let's spend just a moment privately and quietly confessing our sins to the Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we do sin, but we have a God who is full of mercy and grace, who forgives us. Our assurance of pardon is Psalm 103, verses 8 through 12. Hear God's word. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Brothers and sisters, this is good news. Believe the message of the gospel. Find forgiveness in Christ and build your life upon him. You'll see in your order of service that we have a moment for missions. Today we have Aaron Cofield, who's the Director of Church Relations for the Palmetto Women's Center, here to share a brief update about what God is doing in our community. Uh, and if you would like more information, Aaron is going to be sharing more during Sunday school in the faith room. Uh, and so there's a chance to go and hear more uh, from her about the God's work. So Aaron, come and share what the Lord is doing.
First, I'd like to thank the church for allowing me to speak this morning. Um, it's truly an honor to be able to come and share what God's doing through Palmetto Women's Center. In Genesis, God says he made mankind in his own image. Every life is important to God because every life is a reflection of God. Throughout the Bible, God reminds us that he has a plan for us even before he forms us in our mother's womb. The life of the unborn is important to God. It's why we celebrate sanctity of life, because life is sacred and holy to God. Palmetto Women's Center was founded 40 years ago and has been in faithful service to the unborn for 40 years. We had our biggest year yet last year. Uh, 412 women chose life last year, so we saved 412 babies from abortion. We are a 501c3 faith-based nonprofit, um, and we are dedicated to helping women and their partners facing unplanned pregnancies. Our mission is to promote life by offering gospel-centered care and counseling, excellence in medical services, and focused education and resources so that abortion becomes unthinkable. We do that by fostering a community where every individual chooses life for their unborn child, eternal life through faith in Christ Jesus, and abundant life in obedience to him. This is not a small goal. To make abortion unthinkable in a world where it is readily accessible, readily available, and often the first option given to pregnant women seems impossible at times. But we serve a God who tells us in his word that nothing is impossible with him. There are so many ways to get involved in Palmetto Women's Center. I'll talk about a lot of those um, in the upcoming Sunday School Hour. But um, quickly, we need client advocates. We are desperate right now for some client advocates. If you have time Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. until 4 p.m., we could really use some men and women to speak life into our clients, to be able to counsel with them. Um, we need men just as much as we need women because often women come in with their partners and we have very few men to speak to them, to tell them what a joy it is to be a father and how excited they should be. Um, often the man has a lot more influence in this decision than, um, than we think about. Um, so we need men and women for, for client advocates. Um, we need materials. Our goal is that for every obstacle to life a woman brings up, we have a resource to match that. So regardless of what's standing in the way of her choosing life, we want to be able to offer a resource for that. So we need materials. And mostly, we need financial support. We're a nonprofit. It costs $1,200 to save a life. So for $100 a month, you could potentially be saving a life. For $1,200 a month, you could save 12 lives. Um, our goal is to do even more in 2024. So we are praying just um, the verse from Ephesians that God would do abundantly and exceedingly more than we could ever think or imagine. And we can't do that without your help. So if you're interested in helping us in any way, you can contact me at Erin, E-R-I-N, at palmettowomencenter.com. Um, I also have a, a phone number that I'll be happy to give out, and then I'll be sharing some more ways to get involved during the Sunday School Hour. So again, I just want to thank you for giving me the time to come and share with you, and I hope that each of you finds a way that you can be involved at PWC this year. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks for coming and sharing, and praise the Lord for what he's doing, and we pray that he'll continue to be at work. Come now to the time in our service where we give back to the Lord his tithes and our offerings. Remember, this is an act of worship. We want to worship the Lord as cheerful givers, so let us do that now, giving back to our God our tithes and offerings.
Let us pray. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we do praise you, Lord, for the many gifts that you have given us. Lord, you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And Lord, you have blessed us material with all that we have and all that we are. So Lord, take these gifts, use them for the advancement of your kingdom, for the spread of the good news of the gospel here in Rock Hill and all around the world. Lord, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. This time, I want to invite forward our kids, that's kids fifth grade and younger, to come forward for our children's message, and Ms. Connie is going to lead that for us. Good job. I think you're going to go see Daddy right after the children's message. we got some more friends to come in. There you go. That's right. They're saving your space right there. Oh, we're going to need another pew. How wonderful. Good morning. I'm so glad to see all of you today. I brought something to show you today. I don't know if you'll know what this is, but... A drumstick's a good guess. It's not a drumstick. What'd you say? Chopstick, not a chopstick. No, you need two of those to be a chopstick. Somebody said it. Cody, say it again. It's a conductor's baton. That's right. It's what a conductor uses if they're conducting a choir or a band or an orchestra. The conductor's the person that's in charge, right? Tells them to play or not to play. And if you think about it, almost everything kind of always has to have somebody who's in charge, right? Think about in school, in your classroom, who's in charge? Your teacher. And then really even above the teacher is the, for the whole school, the principal. That's right. So there's kind of different levels. We kind of call that, the fancy word for being in charge is authority. So there's kind of different levels of authority. Like at home, the authority is mom and dad. That's right. Good. What about if you're playing on a team, if you're playing basketball or soccer, you got your coach. That's right. And then even when you're playing in the game, there's somebody that usually wears black and white. The referee, they, they're an authority, and they can blow the whistle if something that happens. So there's always these different levels of authority. So here's my question. What about here at church? Who's the authority? Pastor John, that's right, yes. Yeah. And along with Pastor John, we have officers. We have elders and deacons that we elect, and they are kind of our authority here. But again, there's some different levels of authority, like... Above there, we'd have our presbytery, our denomination, or what do you think up at the top, the level of authority? Who's really in charge? God is, that's right. Jesus is, that's right. And we get that in a, from a lot of passages, but one that Pastor John is preaching on today is in Matthew 28. These are the very last words that Jesus told his friends before he was leaving earth and going back into heaven. And he first said, all authority has been given to me in heaven or on earth all authority so all the different levels of authority we keep going all the way up the very very top is Jesus right and then he gave some instructions to go and make disciples now was he just telling those 11 guys who are with him to go and make disciples no that's an instruction for us too right yeah that's right so then we're supposed to go and make disciples now that looks a little different if you're five or ten or fifty or so but we can always use every opportunity to tell people about jesus to invite them to church to invite them to come play basketball with us or bible school that's right so all kinds of things we can invite our friends because ultimately we want to tell everyone we want everyone to know how wonderful king jesus is oh yeah well let's pray together Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus, and we thank you for the knowledge that he is the authority over all of heaven and all of earth, and we rest in that. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for these boys and girls. Help us to all find opportunities this week to tell others about you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
so exciting to see so many kids coming down for our children's message, and we are thankful for uh, how God's at work uh, in our church and, and the folks that are here. Well, today we're concluding our brief sermon series uh, for the month of January that I was entitled Foundations of the Church. I've been looking at key texts that have laid the framework and the foundation for who we are uh, as a church, as our church, but the church universal more importantly. Uh, and this will set the stage as we, in two weeks, will launch into a study of the first half of the book of Acts, and we look at the early church uh, recorded in that book. Well, today our passage is Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. It's printed in your bulletin. It's also found in the Pew Bible in front of you on page 784. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, I, I would love for you to take the one in front of you as our church's gift to you. Before I read this passage, let me pray and ask for the Lord's blessing and his help. Let's pray. Gracious God, you told us that we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Lord, would you open our eyes to see wondrous things in this, your word. Speak, Lord, for your servants listen. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you're able, I invite you to stand with me out of reverence for God's word as I read the passage for us, Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. Hear the word of the Lord. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God remains forever. Please be seated. The Protestant Reformation began back in 1517 with Martin Luther nailing his 95 theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg. But what's interesting about the Protestant Reformation is that it really did not produce any church-sent missionaries for a number of years. In fact, it wasn't until 1732 that two men went out as missionaries, Leonard Dober and David Nietzsche. They left Hernhut, Germany, and ventured to St. Croix in the Caribbean. It was Hernhut's leader, Count Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf, who really spearheaded this mission. Zinzendorf had visited Copenhagen the year before on political business, and while he was there, he met a black man from St. Thomas who pleaded with him to send someone as a missionary to his family members in the Danish West Indies. Back in Hernhut, Zinzendorf shared this burden, and it took root. And a year later, on August 18th, 1732, two young men were commissioned as missionaries. Leonard Dober and David Nietzsche left for Copenhagen seeking passage to the islands. But Copenhagen proved unfriendly and there was obstacle after obstacle to their work. One disappointment followed another. There was much opposition in the city. Nobody really wanted to send them out. Nobody thought this was a good idea. And so doubt began to come over these two men. Their hearts sank, wondering if this really was something that was ever going to happen. At that critical moment, Numbers 23, 19 was the scripture reading for their daily devotional. And it reads, has he said and will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? Well, inspired by these words, the two men believed that God would indeed make good on his promises and he would make a way for them to make it as missionaries. Soon a handful of people in Copenhagen began to help them. The tide of public opinion shifted. Two royal chaplains gave their support. And even the Queen of Denmark encouraged the two men. Princess Charlotte contributed financially. A different court official secured passage for them on a Danish ship. And on October 8, 1732, they sailed for the West Indies. And this began what we know 
as the modern era of missions. God had called these two men to go out, and they responded and said they were willing to go. And this reminds us that God has a mission for his church, and he has a church for his mission. The passage before us this morning is about mission. It's become known as the Great Commission. And this passage is key for us to know what the church is supposed to be about. In this text, we find what we do, how we do it, and why we do it. And that will be our simple outline this morning. So first, what we do. Jesus says in verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. So there it is, right there. What does the church do? The church is to go and make disciples of all nations. But before we can unpack this mission, we need to understand the context in which this great commission was given. Matthew 28 is the last chapter of the gospel according to Matthew. In the first half of Matthew 28, we find the resurrection of Jesus. So where are we at in the Bible? Jesus has died on the cross. He was put in the tomb, but he rose again on the third day, defeating death, hell, and the grave. And before he ascends to heaven, we find this event. Our passage begins by telling us that the eleven went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Jesus and his disciples spent most of the three years that they were together in Galilee. So this was like their home turf. This was where they were comfortable. Many of them were from Galilee. And so Jesus tells them to go back there where they're from and to go to the mountain. What mountain? We don't know. Jesus doesn't tell us. It's not worth speculating what mountain they went to. This is one of the last things that Jesus says before he ascends to heaven. For those of you who have ever lost a loved one, you know that the last words that someone says are some of the most important. They're words to which that you cling. So here we find some of Jesus' last words. And it's in this context that Jesus offers famous words, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. He's speaking to the remaining 11 apostles. Judas had betrayed him and then went out and he had hanged himself, so Jesus was there, so it was 11 disciples. And you know, it's tempting for us to hear this and think, uh, and some people believe, well, this was the, the great commission to the apostles. This is what those 11 men were to do. This has nothing to do t- for us as the church. But that misses something very important at the end of our passage. We'll discuss verse 20 in more detail later on, but the last sentence says, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The phrase always, even to the end of the age, is literally all the days, even to the end of the day, the end of the age. Which means that Jesus has promised his presence throughout the entirety of the age, from when he goes to heaven until when he comes back. But the apostles were not going to live that entire time. Peter, James, and John, the rest of the eleven are not alive today. They're long dead. And so the promise of the presence of Christ couldn't have just been for them. It was for the entire church age. And so the promise and the mission, the commission of to go and make disciples of all nations is not just for the 11, it's for the entire church throughout the age. We're to go and make disciples of all nations. The first part, go, is important. To the eleven, this meant to go out from Jerusalem. Later, Jesus would tell them to go to Jerusalem, Acts 1.8, and wait for the Holy Spirit, and then they may be his witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. But they're first to go to Jerusalem. And in Acts 2, we see the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Um, But the, the eleven end up staying put there for a while. They struggle going out. And we'll see as we study the book of Acts in, a coming, in coming weeks how the apostles really stayed in Jerusalem, maybe longer than they, were, they should have. But slowly they started going out. And you know, we too can struggle to go out. Too often we are like the comfort of what we know. We like the comfort of our church. We're comfortable with the people. We know them. We like them. We're friends with them. It's just easier to be around people similar to us. And so we fail to go out. 
But Jesus says, go. Does this mean we're all called to be missionaries to another country? No. But perhaps some are called. Have you ever prayed whether or not God is calling you to be a missionary? Parents, have you prayed whether or not the Lord might be calling your kids to be missionaries? We need more missionaries. We need to pray that God would raise up missionaries. But we don't just have to go across the world. We can also go across the street to our friends or our neighbors, our coworkers, our family members, to the kids at school, the kids on our sports team. Going doesn't just mean across the world. How can you go? To whom is God calling you to go? To whom is God calling us as a church to go and proclaim his message? The church goes and then does what? Makes disciples of all nations. Notice that the command isn't go and share the gospel. It isn't go and grow the church. It isn't even go and make converts, although all of those are assumed in what Jesus says. But Jesus says something overarching, even more important. Go and make disciples. Certainly we proclaim the gospel message. Romans 10, 17 says, So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. We must proclaim the good news. But the goal isn't just simply sharing the message. No, the goal is making disciples. And that raises a, an important question. What exactly is a disciple? A disciple is someone who follows Jesus. Yes, they were the 12 disciples while Jesus was on earth. But beyond that, disciples are really anyone who follows Jesus. A disciple is someone who loves Jesus, who worships him, who obeys him, who is devoted to him. And you know, a disciple is not an elite status in the kingdom of God. It isn't reserved for a select few. All Christians are disciples. And if you aren't a disciple, then you're not a Christian. So we're to go and make disciples. We're to make disciples of all nations. This means all people groups, not just people like us, but all peoples. Once again, this can be right here in Rock Hill. God has brought in some ways the nations to our city. Many different ethnic groups right here in our own town. It could also be going internationally on a short-term mission trip or as a full-time missionary, but it doesn't have to be. The famous pastor and evangelist D.L. Moody was attending a convention in Indianapolis uh, on mass evangelism. And partway through that, he asked the lead, uh, the song leader for the, for the conference, uh, a man named Ira Sankey, to meet him at 6 o'clock one evening at a certain street corner. When Sankey arrived, Mr. Moody asked him to stand on a box and sing. Slowly, people started to gather and stop and listen to the singing. Eventually, he stopped, and Moody preached and shared the good news of Jesus for a little while, and then he invited people to come with him to the convention hall. Soon, the auditorium was filled with spiritually hungry people, and the great evangelist preached the gospel to them. Then, the convention delegates began to arrive. So Moody stopped preaching and said, Now we must close, as the brethren of the convention wish to come and discuss the topic, how to reach the masses. Moody graphically illustrated the difference between talking about doing something and actually going out and doing it. And friends, sometimes I think we get so busy talking about it. How can we best reach our town of Rock Hill? And that's important. We want to talk about that. But let's not just stop there. Let's actually go out and share the good news. The mission of the church is to make disciples of all nations, which means that the mission of the church is not solving social issues. It's not ending poverty or fighting homelessness or addressing immigration. The mission of the church is not to bring peace or shalom to the world. It isn't even to promote human flourishing. Does that mean that we can't care about these things in our lives? No, of course not. We should care about them. As individuals, we can be involved in different efforts around town. But that is not the mission of the church. 
We must not confuse what we might be involved in as individuals with the overarching mission of the church. What is the church's mission? To make disciples of all nations. That's what we must be about. That is what we do. But secondly, we need to see how we do it. How do we go about making disciples of all nations? Well, Jesus tells us. Look at verses 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Jesus gives two instruments for how the church is to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing and teaching. So first, baptism. Scripture teaches that baptism is a sign and seal of the grace of God and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We observed the sacrament of baptism last Sunday at the 11 o'clock service. Baptism signifies the washing of our sins. Reminds us of our adoption into Christ. It tells us of our reception of all the benefits of Christ's work on our behalf. Scripture teaches that the proper recipients of baptism are all those who profess their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ together with their children. Jesus commands us to baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is one of the first, if not the first, in Scripture uh, references to the Trinity. The idea of one God and three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But that's not really the key aspect of this passage. What this does give us is the Trinitarian formula. It's why when we baptize, we say we baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But when when Jesus says baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he means more than just the formula of what happens in a baptism service. Literally, we are baptized into the name, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Galatians 3.27, Paul says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. In other words, if genuine faith is present, we are united to Christ. All of his obedience is ours. All of his blessings are ours. We are united to him. It's the theological doctrine, union with Christ. And that is part of what baptism signifies. When making disciples, we must pray that God would bring them to faith and give them a desire to receive the covenant sign of baptism. Baptism is a sacrament of initiation into the covenant community, which means the Great Commission is telling us to go and make disciples, and when we baptize them, we're bringing them together in in local churches. It's not just go and and bring masses to faith. It's go and and bring people into faith and, and then bring them into the local church. We're baptized into Christ, yes, but we're also baptized into his church. But we don't just run around and and baptize anyone and everyone. Like, you get some water, you get some water, everybody gets some water. No, Jesus says we baptize, yes, but then we also teach. Teaching them to observe everything Jesus has commanded us. Friends, that's a huge undertaking. What did Jesus teach? He taught a lot of things. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, full of the teachings of Jesus. Instruction in the faith is about what we believe and also how we are to live. Both of those are essential. Our theology, what we believe about God, is crucial. Because if we get that wrong, we're going to have a low view of God. It's going to impact our worship. But our theology, what we believe, also should translate into how we live. Christianity involves our ethics. We're not saved by good works. No, we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Yet our good deeds are a sign that we have professed our faith in Christ. Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, the Apostle Paul says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. God desires that we would grow to be more like him every day. As a church, we must teach people the truth and how they're to live. This happens each Lord's Day when when I or somebody else would preach from this pulpit. It also happens during Sunday school. 
It occurs in Bible studies and circles and small groups. It occurs in Bible study fellowship and other ministries around town. Discipleship is a process. We must not think that we've arrived, that we've somehow maxed out on what we need to know and how we should live as followers of Christ. We will always be learning until the Lord calls us home. How are you growing as a disciple of Christ? Are you taking advantage of the ordinary means of grace that God has given for your spiritual growth? And are you helping disciple others? This could be through one-on-one mentorship. It could be through volunteering in our youth ministry or our children's ministry. It could be just going to your neighbors uh, and your coworkers and inviting them to church and talking about what you believe. What do we do as a church? We make disciples of all nations. How do we do it? Jesus says, baptizing and teaching. And lastly, why? Why do we do what we do? Why should we be involved in this mission of the church? Well, the easy answer would be because Jesus says so. We find a command here. It's an imperative. Go and make disciples of all nations. So Jesus says so. We should do it. You know, those of you with young kids probably give this kind of answer to your kids. Mommy, why do I need to eat my vegetables? Because I said so. Daddy, why do I need to go to bed now? Because I said so. And there's nothing wrong with that answer. Kids, if your parents say that, you need to listen and obey them. But oftentimes, I think we love our kids to give them a more fuller answer than just because I said so. We tell them to eat their vegetables because we want them to have a balanced meal and to get important vitamins uh, and minerals. Tell them to go to bed at a decent time because their bodies need sleep, and so do ours. Here, Jesus gives two key reasons why we are to go and make disciples of all nations. First, in verse 18, he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus, the eternal Son of God, has always had authority. Yet when he came and took on human nature, that authority in some ways was veiled for a season. Matthew 20, 28, Jesus says, The Son of Man came not to, serve, not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. But upon his resurrection, he reassumed all the authority that has always been his. And the language here in Matthew 28 comes right from Daniel 7. Daniel 7, 13 and 14, it says, And behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. And his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Friends, Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. It's a reminder of his omnipotence. That he is sovereign. He is all-powerful. And this all-powerful Jesus commissions his church to go and make disciples. Therefore, when we go, we go with his authority. Friends, this is comforting. We don't go in our own power. We don't go in our own ability. We don't go in our own authority. No, we go on the authority of the risen and reigning king of the universe. That should give us comfort as we seek to make disciples of all nations. The other reason we go and make disciples is because Jesus is present with us. Remember how our text ends. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. It's a reminder of Christ's presence. He's omnipotent, he's all-powerful, and he's also omnipresent. He's everywhere and he's with us. Matthew's gospel began with this same assurance. Matthew 1, verse 23, Jesus quotes, or Matthew quotes Isaiah and says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. The Gospel of Matthew has bookends of the presence of Jesus with his people. And so when we go and make disciples, we go not on our own, but we go with Christ. He promises comfort, support, strength, wisdom, and the ability to actually accomplish this mission. Friends, that's comforting. Let that give you strength as you seek to be a part of this mission. Friends, this text is a powerful one. No wonder it's been called the Great Commission. It indeed is great. 
It is a great mission for the church. It is a great message for the world. We have a great God who empowers us to do it. Fritz Chrysler, the world famous violinist, earned a fortune doing it for his concerts uh, and compositions, but he was known for generously giving away most of his wealth. And so one day he's traveling around in Europe and he finds a very uh, famous and very exquisite violin. And he wanted to buy it, but he didn't have the money to. And so after a while, he collected enough funds and he goes back to buy it, only to be told it's been sold to a collector. He decides to go and see that collector and see if perhaps the, the man might sell it to him. He goes and he offers to buy it, but the collector said it's become his prized possession and he would not sell it. Chrysler was disappointed with this, was about to leave when an idea came to him. He said, sir, could, could I play the instrument once more before it is consigned to silence? Permission was granted and the great virtuoso filled the room with such heart-moving music that the collector's emotions were deeply moved. I have no right to keep that to myself, he exclaimed. It's yours, Mr. Chrysler. Take it into the world and let people hear hear it. Friends, we have no right to keep the message of Christ to ourselves. Let us go and take it to the world and let them hear the good news. Our hope is that we have a great God. He is building his church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it as we saw last week. And we can be a part of his work going and making disciples. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this passage. Lord, it is convicting and it is challenging, but it's also comforting. Lord, we praise you for your power and your presence. Lord, that motivates us to go and make disciples of all nations. Lord, give us boldness to seek to be a part of this mission. Lord, with this guide, what we are about is First ARP Church. Lord, help us to indeed make disciples of all nations. Lord, wherever we go, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, would that be in the back of our mind? Lord, help us to pray that you would do great things and that you would use us. Lord, we pray for people to come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ here around our church. Lord, whether that's at the exchange apartments or uh, in the neighborhoods around the church or wherever it might be in our town. Lord, there is a lost and dying world around us in desperate need of the gospel. Lord, you alone can convert dead sinners, give them living faith. And so we pray that you would do that. We pray that we would be faithful to make disciples. Lord, help us to baptize and to teach. Lord, that we would not just tell people the good news, but train them up in the faith. We may be lifelong followers of Christ. Lord, we pray for various ministries in our community that, that seek to do that through uh, different avenues. Lord, we pray for the Palmetto Women's Center. Lord, thank you that Aaron is here to share about what you're doing. Lord, I pray your blessing upon that ministry. Lord, I thank you for the desire uh, to save lives of unborn children. Lord, I also thank you that there's a desire to, to uh, not just physically save, but to spiritually save, as only you can do. So Lord, use uh, advocates to, to just share the good news of Christ. Whether those in crisis would see their biggest need is the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or would you raise up many to be involved at Palmetto Women's Centers and other ministries around our town? Lord, we pray uh, for our children and young people. Lord, we pray your blessing upon them be at work in their lives. Lord, we pray that you would uh, continue to lead in God. Lord, we pray for those that are struggling. We pray for Mary Robinson that she has to have another knee surgery. Lord, keep her um, in good spirits. Lord, as I'm sure she is discouraged. Lord, I pray that the surgery would go well and that her recovery would be smooth. Bless her and Bob. Father, we um, just pray for those that are, that are grieving. Lord, we think of Libby Elder as she grieves the passing of her brother Tim. Lord, comfort her. And Father, we do pray for little Elijah as well uh, up at Duke. Lord, we pray that you give doctors wisdom and bless her family, encourage them. Well, there's many struggling in lots of different ways. We pray that you, the God of all peace and comfort, would be at work. And Lord, would you receive all the honor, the glory, and the praise. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.
As we close our service, we'll stand and take our black folders and sing number 47, O Church Arise. This fits perfectly with the mission of the church to make disciples. Let us stand and sing praise to the Lord. Brothers and sisters, let me remind you that God is at work in this world. He's chosen to use his church. He's given us the great commission. So go and play your part. Play it faithfully. and Play it with God's blessing as it go out. Receive now the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, both now and forevermore. Now go forth and serve the Lord. Amen.